Welcome to Barbarian! <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Guys, it is a real pleasure to be able to welcome you to my living room uh, with all my bar Barbarian brothers here. Uh, it's going to be an awesome time getting to share with you guys tonight. But as we come and have this word together, guys, there's something about coming and feasting together, isn't it, around what God is saying. Okay, so we're going to come and feast tonight on his word, and we're going to come and absorb this truth and extract it for our lives. And uh, as I, I was preparing this tonight, I was thinking about what it means for us to be men. Like, how would you describe masculinity? Now, there is probably the biggest struggle in our world right now is like, what is masculinity? Is it, uh, you know, what, how do you define it? Um, there, there's something about it's celebrated, but it's also, it seems to be uh, up for grabs by anyone right now. And, uh, and it's almost hard to define. So I wonder if some of my guys would help me out tonight. Like, what would you, how would you describe masculinity? Anyone got a? Protector. Protector, yeah. Anyone oh, else? Provider. Provider. Leader. Leader. Advocate. Advocate. Passionate. Passionate. Anything else? Strong man. Strong man. <laughs> Do you know what? He laughed. He laughed. But that was the one I was looking for. Thank you, Sol. Because there is something about the strength of what it means to be a man that that is part of who we are as men. And I think that there is something... Um, very powerful for us as guys, where we're always trying to appear strong. That's one of the things, because we're trying to emulate to be a man, is I appear strong. And so we want to try and uh, give other people that perception of who we are. And I'm not just talking about our physical strength, but I'm talking about our emotional strength. Yeah. I'm trying to talk about who we are as people. There is something about, I am a man because I'm strong. And it's something that you define mostly with masculinity. And there's something about uh, the, the reality that all of us are trying to give a perception that we're strong, yeah. but we actually all know that we've got weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. But why don't we want to open up about those weaknesses? Why don't we want to acknowledge those weaknesses? It's because we want everyone to think that we're strong. Yeah. So if we start sharing like what's really going on in our lives, if we share about how we're feeling emotionally, or what's been going on, or some of the things that we feel like we're lacking in, all of a sudden, we don't get to appear as strong as we once did. And that's a real problem for us, because the message I have for you tonight is that God wants to use our weaknesses. But if we spend the whole time trying to cover up for them, and making sure that no one sees them, and that we're looking strong, God then doesn't use them in the way that he desires. Because we've got to be able to own them and acknowledge them. So what are your weaknesses? What's coming to mind right now? Do you know them? I think that there's something funny about our weaknesses is that we know them better than anyone else, right? Yeah. Because we're living with this guy the whole time and we can't get away from him. And we know his shortcomings. His fault. It's like, I say this, but I did this. What the? What's wrong with me? But it's that we know our own weaknesses. But there's something about, I know them, but I don't want you to know them. <laughs> but there's something about being a barbarian where we are different from the world and we start to let people in to that conversation. And that's powerful, guys, because there are men all over the world, whether they're in schools, in colleges, in locker rooms, in, uh, in sports teams, in workplaces, that are trying to put on a perception of strength. Yeah. That everyone would, would get an understanding that this is their image, this is who they are. But we, as men of God, have to be different to that. Yeah, wow. Even though we're in those work environments where you don't get a look in, where you never see that weakness, where we're in those school environments where you would never guess that that was going on in their lives. But we, as men, as Christian men, have to be different. But we have to start acknowledging our weaknesses. I remember one, one of the things that I grew up with in school, this is one of the ones for me. I remember being, having a weakness at art. Because I was terrible. I mean, I still am now. A terrible artist. I remember my, uh, my art teacher, Mr. Cook, God bless him. He really did give me his best shot. Like he tried to, you know, mentor me. And he, he, I know he liked me as a student, 
but he gave up on me as artist. There was there was no hope there. There was no hope. It was just like just, I don't know what I'm telling the brain. The brain's saying do this, and it, it's not happening. It's just not happening. It still looks awful. Um, and so there was something about that weakness. Then started to define the way I saw myself. So oh, I'm not really a creative person because I can't draw and I can't paint and I can't do uh, you know use an easel. Um, so <laughs> pastels. Um, I can't do any of it, none of it, watercolours, keep throwing at me and I can't do it. Um, should have seen my clay sculptures, they were truly atrocious. Um, and, uh, but there was something about my understanding of my weakness started to uh, define and almost limit what I could do. But my first job that I started doing when I came out of school was, uh, one of them was to do web design. One of them was to do graphic design where they were creative things that years ago I thought, oh no, I just can't do those things, but it was just a different method. It was just a different way of doing it. And so what came to almost like box me was like, hold on, that's not just a weakness. It's actually something that God can use. But I think for a lot of us that the way we are perceived is more important than our reality. You think about what we put on Instagram. It's often, it's the highlight reel. I mean, I'm talking like Instagram. I mean, hardly any of you, the boys here use it because uh, almost like things have moved on. We're a bit over Instagram. But when we were using Instagram a lot, uh, there was something about, it was almost like a highlight reel. And there's something about this is all the good things that are doing, but we often don't show the weaknesses, the things that we're struggling with, do we? I mean, it would be a bit of a depressing feed perhaps. Um, but there's something about all of us that we want to seem better than we actually are. It's like even, you know, you look in schools and they want to give out participation medals because it's like we don't want anyone to feel weak, to feel lesser than. But if you don't feel weaker or lesser than, there's often not that drive for change. There's often not that recognition to go after it. So labels are the weakness that the world can put on us. The first one is shy. So maybe that's a weakness that you can relate to tonight is that you have been told or felt that you're shy. And that makes it difficult for you to maybe interact in certain environments because oh, I'm just a shy person. And there's been a limitation that's been attached to that weakness. Yeah. Maybe dyslexic. Maybe you're someone who struggled with spelling and reading. And it's an amazing thing that people who grow up feeling like dis having a, uh, dyslexia is a weakness, often in areas of life, they are very creative or they think in a totally different way that actually gives them a strength. Yeah, wow. And you can start to see how this weakness, yeah. or this perceived weakness that can maybe bring shame or embarrassment is actually, it can become a strength. Oh, everyone's maybe always said you're a loud mouth. Oh, that's my weakness. That's just a, the thing I sometimes speak before I think. But actually, God can use that too. What are the weaknesses that you've spoken out about yourself? Maybe it's that you're unqualified. Maybe God's calling you to do something right now in your life that is radical, that is beyond you, that is something that is going to take a miracle to happen and you just feel unqualified for it. God can use you even though you feel unqualified. Even though you feel like that's a weakness. I don't have all the credentials. I don't have all the experience. And yet God can use you. Maybe you're someone who gets overwhelmed. And things that happen and it's all of a sudden you just become stressed and you have this inability to be able to move forward. Maybe you're someone who is insecure. that You just question all the time. What, are, what do others think of me? Can I really go and do this? You can see how some of these weaknesses, they play out in our lives. Maybe you're someone who struggles with anxiety. And again, there's this freezing up in moments where you want to step forward, but you just feel this anxiety. What is one weakness right now that you can write down that you just feel like, maybe it's one of those that I've just spoken, but something that you know that you know about yourself. Maybe it's your lack of organization. <laughs> Maybe it's your sporadic, maybe it's your distracted. But there is something about recognising our weaknesses. 
So just take a moment and write that down. What's one weakness that you know about yourself? The people of the world have this perception, and we get caught up in this as well, that we have to be strong. We have to have it all together. We want to present ourselves as being fully prepared and ready for uh, whatever we're called to. But the reality is, is that God uses those that are weak, that know they're weak. And we, th- there's this crazy paradox where we're thinking like, if, if I get stronger, God will use me. And where God's saying, if you just recognize your weaknesses, I can use you. But we don't want to do that. We want to keep them concealed. But God wants them to be revealed. And if we can reveal them instead of conceal them, then God can use them. And I just want to like bring your attention to Moses. Okay, so Moses is someone who has uh, this injustice in his heart and it spills out into anger and he falls out with an Egyptian and he kills him. Okay, so Moses has got maybe a temper. He's aggressive. He's violent. And also, after this, he runs away. So there are decades where he's gone uh, and left Egypt, left this conviction that he had that things were, were not right with the way that his people were being treated. And he ends up being a runner, being angry, having committed murder. And God's like, I want to use that guy. It's like, really, God? That's, that's, that's the best you got. Is there no one else? But even when then God calls him, Moses is the first one to say, I'm not the guy for the job. Come on, I think you might, you might have someone else is, is going to be better than this than me. And then he finally agrees to do it, but he says, well, I, I can't go and talk to Pharaoh. I've got this speaking problem. I've got this stutter. And it's like God has come after... Do you think God doesn't know this? God doesn't know of Moses' weaknesses. That he struggles to speak. It's like God chose him because he knows these things. And it's trusting God with those weaknesses. Whatever you feel ashamed about, embarrassed about, sometimes it takes away from who you are as a man. might be the very thing that God wants to use in your life. Just come to terms with that for a minute because we, we don't want to hear that. There wasn't many amens in the room. Because it's like the very thing that we feel ashamed of or embarrassed about or want to conceal is the very thing that God is wanting to use in our lives for his power and his kingdom and his glory. He's seeking them out. He's finding them. He's calling them out. Even through this message tonight, God is calling those out. If you recognize your weakness, come to me. I'll use you. I can use you for my kingdom. Because it's not as if anyone is truly strong, right? None of us are. We are all weak in some way. But it's only when we recognize those weaknesses that God can work through them. Yeah, so just get that for a minute. Because I know that in this church, right, we, we can see others around us. And we can see leaders or we can see people in position or authority. And we can look up to them and see their, uh, the way they present and think, oh man, they are so strong. I want to be a strong leader like they are. And our job as leaders is to often tell you, hey, no, we're like you guys. <laughs> so we're still working things through. There are things that we fail in. There are things that we have to overcome. There are things that we are calling out to God on and saying, God, we need you in this. But also it's on you to not try and be that strong person, but to recognize that actually each one of us has a weakness. Acknowledge it and then let God use it. I want to tell you the story in Judges 3 uh, verses 12 to 28. And it's it's a story you don't hear very often in church. uh, And it's quite an unusual one. And it's it's actually a little bit graphic in places. So (laughs) it's one for the boys. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to start off, it says, because uh, in the book of Judges, what happens is this back and forth between uh, where they're seeing great grace in the nation of Israel as it's been newly established. And then the Israelites turn away from God and then God sends a leader called a judge 
who goes in and almost turns things around and God uses them to redeem the situation. So it says here, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Okay. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. So just a quick note here, just if you like your kind of details and you like your, uh, you know, visuals, Eglon means fat ox. (laughs) That was his name. That was the king's name. Can you believe that? Fat ox was the king. And you'll see why in a minute, because this guy, he was big. And he says it gave him power over Israel, getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him. Eglon, fat ox, (laughs) came and attacked Israel and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, fat ox, (laughs) king of Moab for 18 years. Okay, for 18 years. Guys, just just get your minds around that for a moment. 18 years of oppression, 18 years of being subject to, 18 years of a ruler of another nation over you. This is what the Israelites were putting up with. This is what they were enduring. We can read it as a quick sentence in the Bible, but that's a long time to be under someone else's rule, to be under enemy rule, to, be, uh, to have your land occupied. So, In verse 15, it says, again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Jerah, the Benjamite. So Ehud means left hand, uh, that he gets introduced, okay, as the left-handed man. A lefty, eh? Got another lefty in the room tonight? Got any other lefties? A few lefties in here? Any lefties, barbarians? Give us a wave. Okay. (laughs) Um, guys, there, th- this Ehud is the only uh, lefty that's named in the Bible, okay? So this is kind of an unusual guy. And maybe it's something, again, that you would read about and really think, so what? And just read past it. Like, what's the, what's the significance of what hand he is? Because in our society, we don't really think a lot about right and left-handed. It's not really like you're defined in a different way. But in ancient times, it was. It was seen very differently, okay? It was seen as not natural. Sorry, lefties. (laughs) It was seen as a disadvantage. It was seen as something that parents would try to train out of their child. So it was almost like this disability, this difference, because he had this disposition of a left hand. You could always call it that he was weak-handed. That would probably be another way of putting it. Even language gives us a bit of an impression of how how being a lefty has been seen through history, right? The French word for left is gauche, and it means awkward. (laughs) Right? We call something sinister or wicked, use the word sinister. That's the word for left in Latin. Because there was something about the, the strangeness, the oddness of being a lefty. So when we hear that this man, Ehud, is left-handed, you've got to see it within this context. This man was an oddity. He was different. He was strange. His parents tried. They couldn't train him out of him. He was still a lefty, okay? But he had this perceived weakness, okay? So we're going to keep going with this scripture. So the Israelites sent uh, with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. That means they sent him a gift, okay? Now, Ehud had made a double-edged sword, about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. So even as we look at this guy now, the left-handed, the weak-handed guy, guess who's been making his own sword? The craftsman, the one that's weak-handed, is the one that's actually seems like a bit of a blacksmith. Yeah, yeah. And he's been making this double-edged sword that is customised to his own thigh. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Pretty cool. But even now, you see like this guy who is weak-handed being creative, being a blacksmith, using the skills of his hands to make a weapon. And then we've got some real James Bond stuff going on. Okay? Because this guy is sneaking in a weapon. He's got it strapped to his thigh. So let's see what happens next. So he's got it in his, on his right thigh under his clothing. 
It said he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. <laughs> so they're just spelling it out for us here in scripture. There's, there's no, you know, there's no doubts here. He's got, yeah, there's issues. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us. And they all left. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade <laughs> and his bowels discharged. <laughs> guys, this is the Bible. If you're not reading your Bible, you need to read what's in here, guys, because it's fascinating. Mate, PG-13 tonight. <laughs> Ehud did not pull the sword out and the fat closed in over it. <laughs> this is outrageous. <laughs> then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he'd gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said... He must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. Why? Because they can smell it. <laughs> they waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw the Lord, fallen, their, their Lord, fallen to the floor, dead. And while they waited, Ehud had got away. So this guy, he's gone in, one on one, He's used his secret weapon, then he snuck out on the porch, locked the room. This is like your first ever secret agent. <laughs> it is quite amazing. So he passed by the stone images and escaped to Sariah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fort of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel and the land had peace for 80 years. Amazing. OK, amazing story. And so this this power was overthrown by this warrior, by this judge. And I think of Ehud, this, this guy that, his, the way he's described is he's left-handed. It's like, it's his very description, it's his identity. The very hand that had defined him his whole life was the hand that God used to deliver Israel. The very weakness that had defined him his whole life was the weakness that God used to deliver Israel. His weakness was made into strength. Not only can God use your weaknesses, it's not like, okay, I will make it work. He's not looking at you going, all right, he's, he's kind of, he gets overwhelmed, but we can work with that. You know, it's like God actually desires to use your weaknesses. How amazing is that? He's not just going, okay, we'll, we'll get by. We'll, we'll, we'll get around it. I'll make a plan, you know, B and C if, if they're struggling. He, actually, God wants to use your weaknesses. Do you know the problem is, is that we often don't. We don't want to give them to him. We don't want to be open about them. We try to hide and conceal them. God will even go to the extreme of making you weaker and weaker. So that there is more power that he can release through us. You think about what God does with Gideon, right? He's, he raises an army and they've got 32,000 Israelites against the Midianites and they're outnumbered. And God's like, it's too many. What? We're already outnumbered. No, like, I, want, I want less than this. We've got, to, we've got to cut the numbers right down. And God goes through 
and takes them all the way down to just 300 warriors. And then he's like, I can work with this. Because God, he said, oh, how are we going to get more warriors? We want to get stronger. And God's saying, no, we're going to get weaker. And then you watch what I can do with those that are weak. Guys, there are those here listening to this message around the world today. You need to start acknowledging and accepting your weakness. Because when you do, God can start to reclaim it and use it for his glory and his power. You watch what God will do with it. But you've got to stop running from it. Your weakness is not out of the reach of being used by God. In 2 Corinthians 12 verses 5 to 10, we hear Paul write about his weakness. Okay? So 2 Corinthians 12 verses 5 to 10. And Paul says, I will boast only about my weaknesses. Boasting about your weaknesses. Imagine doing that at Barbarians. Right, guys, who's going who's gonna to boast first tonight about your weakness? Be a good, uh, good activity. <laughs> if I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud... I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from being proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. This is powerful stuff, guys. This is Paul, the apostle, Paul, the teacher, Paul, this great guy who's writing scripture. And he's he's saying, I've got this weakness. And I'm saying, God, please take it away. And each time, He said, my grace is all you need. Uh, You don't need me to take it away. What you need is my grace. And then, then check this out. My power works best in weakness. My power works best in weakness. Isn't that mind blowing? Because we think his power works best in strength. When I'm stronger when I'm complete, when I'm finished, when I'm ready, when I'm strong, then God's going to use me. No, you make yourself available in your weakness and see what God does with it. What I think is interesting here is it said, my power works best in weakness. It's like you can still access God's power when you're not embracing your weakness, but it's like it doesn't work best. It's like the special source, like the real, the real way the whole thing comes together is if you allow God to work through your weaknesses. It's not like, okay, if you're, if you, he, his power doesn't work. It's like, no, it works best. It works best. Don't you want God's power to work best in your life? Yeah? yeah? Come on. Do we? Yeah. Then we've got to recognize that some of those weaknesses there, God is actually maybe even allowing in our lives. And then Paul says, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and the hardships, the persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The weaknesses that we have are the key to God's power in our lives. I think if we come back to looking at Ehud and in Judges 3.15, as well as saying he's a left-handed man, there's one other thing that we find out about him, okay? It's the tribe that he's from. It's the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin means son of my right hand. So the whole tribe is defined by being (laughs) right-handed. Son of my right hand. And you got this guy... Who's the lefty? Have you ever felt like you don't fit in? Have you ever felt like you're different from everyone else? His whole clan, his whole family, his tribe and identity have been about the right hand. And he's left-handed. <laughs> you felt different from everyone else. Not able to fit in. 
it's like, that's probably because God's designed you that way. Yeah. And we, there is part of us that so wants to conform. We want to be like everyone else. So I want to try and be more like this person. And I just feel like I don't fit. Good. Because that's the way that God made you. Yeah. You're not meant to fit. You're meant to be different. Yeah. Because whatever that thing that is that makes you different might be the very thing that God wants to use for his glory and his purposes. Right. When Ehud embraced the perceived weakness that he had and allowed God to use it for his glory, he delivered a nation. What about that? It's not just that he beats one guy or he overcomes it in one situation. He delivers the entire nation by embracing his weakness, by his perceived weakness. And I think that that word perceived weakness is really important tonight, guys, because I think a lot of it is about what we perceive to have been a weakness. What, do we, what have we perceived to be a weakness in our lives? So that's something that we've told ourselves. Maybe something that others have spoken out over us. Maybe something that the enemy has even taunted about who we are. And actually, it's a perceived weakness. Because God uses this perceived weakness in Ehud's story to deliver the nation. And how do we know in Scripture what went down in such detail? Because think about it, we know from scripture, there's only two guys there. So really, we've got the account of Ehud. And what's he doing? He's telling everyone, guess which hand it was, guys? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. It was my left hand, the left hand warrior. I'll tell you how I did it. It was strapped to my right thigh. And then I grabbed it with my left hand and boom. Because there was something about embracing his weakness. There was no shame on it. He didn't try and say, oh yeah, actually, I, I overcame my weakness. I overcame my oddity. It was actually, no, I used my left hand. I used, and that's what he became famed for. That's why we re- re- read it in scripture today, because he was telling about the way that God had used his perceived weakness. So if we can stop being limited by our weaknesses and allowing God to work through them, we can have incredible impact as God's power works through us. God's spirit within us is stronger than any weakness that we have. God's spirit within us is stronger than any weakness that we have. And I think sometimes, right guys, it's almost like we get this complex of we build up our weakness to being so, oh, I could never do that. Yeah. I could never share my testimony. I could never be up the front. I could never be in the worship team. I can never go on mission. Because that thing becomes greater and bigger than God in our lives. Right. But there ain't no weakness that is in any single one of us that is greater than who God is and his power. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe that there are some people that need to be reminded of that tonight. There are some things that you've spoken out over yourself that say, I could never do that because of. And actually, there is nothing, there is nothing of your weakness that is greater than the God that is within you. He can overcome, he can use you despite anything. So why does God all the way in the Bible seek those who know their weaknesses? I used the the example of Gideon earlier. The angel turns up out of the whole of Israel and it's like, okay, yeah, you, mighty warrior, let's go. You, I've got a mission for you. And Gideon's like, who, who me? It's like, no, 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 I'm like the worst of the worst. I'm the least of my clan. I'm the, le- the least in my family. He, he described himself as weak. He didn't see it. But that was who the angel came and knocked on the door. That's the one that he came to speak to. So why does God do it that way? First of all, because he finds humility. There is something about our character that if we can recognise our weaknesses and acknowledge them, you get a humble man. How many people know, right, that we are struggling in this world right now with pride and arrogance of people who think they know all the answers. And when you've got someone, a man, who recognises actually, I don't know it all. Actually, I need God. That humility, that's the very thing that God then can use in our lives because God lifts up the humble. 
he opposes the, opposes the proud. Those that know their weaknesses can practice humility. Like Paul even uses this in, in the scripture we, we read in Corinthians. He's like, to save me from my own pride. Like, oh, the great Paul, all the things that I've done and achieved, all the scriptures, revelation that God has given me. Actually, this keeps me humble. And there's something about the grounding of our weaknesses. So when you're getting so frustrated and when maybe you're getting, why am I still struggling with this? What's going on? Why is this happening? Just recognize that maybe God just wants to keep you grounded. He wants to keep you humbled because when you're humbled, he can lift you up. But if you become proud, then he has to oppose you. The second reason why God seeks out those who know their weaknesses is God co-works with us. Okay, God co-works with us. If we're strong, we don't need God because we did it all by ourselves. But when you recognize that actually, I can't do this by myself, then we co-work with him. He comes alongside us and stands with us and then... We get to do it together. And that is God's heart for us. That was his heart in the garden. God didn't just say, hey, hey, Adam, you just sit there on a, on, under the tree and I'll do everything. It's like, hey, no, Adam, why don't you name the animals? Why don't you look after this garden? I'm going to be creating. You name them. It's like, there's going to be this, this working alongside together. Even with all these stories that we read about, say, whether it's Moses or whether it's uh, the judges that we read about, don't you think that God could have just taken care of, of old fat ox himself? He, he didn't need Ehud to go and do it. He could have just sent death upon that king. But there's something about the co-working, the coming alongside. That's God's heart for us as men. He wants to work with us. Okay? But if you're so puffed up in, in your strength and trying to show that, no, this is who I am. You don't need God. You can do it by yourself. But those that recognize their weakness know, I can't do this without God. I, ca I cannot do this without God. I, I can't tell you how many times I've come and like prepared something for barbarians. Or, and I'm like, I, I can't do this without you, God. I, I can't go in front of the guys and not have you with me. Because I know my own weakness. I know my own failings. And it's that like I can't afford to go up there without you. Yeah, right. And thirdly, only God can get the glory. Yeah. Why does he seek out those who know their weakness? Because only God can get the glory. And that's so important, guys. Because it's where the glory is meant to go. He is so worthy that he doesn't get enough praise and honour that he is so worthy of. But also... We can't handle that. It's not good for us. And if we start receiving the glory, if we start accepting the, for the victories and the battles that are overcome, it, it poisons us. But there's something about if we are those that recognize our weaknesses, we're like, it was God. It, was God. Yeah. it wasn't me. It wasn't my great skills and strength. It was God and all the glory to him. Just a few examples of how God does this. Um, and he takes our weaknesses and uses them as strength. Um, Rose, my wife, when we first got together, uh, it was about two years before Rose ever prayed out loud. Wow. And um, I am always amazed when I think back, because Rose was someone who grew up going to church, but she did not have the confidence to speak out loud. And yet, if you looked at her, you would never have guessed. She's going to go and set up a training program that's going to help people find confidence to pray all over the world. But if you look to you say, oh, okay, no, that person can't do that. That's, that's a weakness for them. They don't have that confidence. They don't have that authority. They can't step up in that way. And God's like, I want to use that person. That person that can't pray out loud for two years. That's the one I want to use. Um... Uh, I got a friend who had a really significant drug addiction um, and for many years going through a very difficult life and again looking at his life 
you would foresee only brokenness and heartbreak and probably death. But now he's been saved and redeemed and goes around speaking his testimony over churches across the USA and also has set up support groups in churches to help them get free of addiction. So you see something that was his weakness is like addiction, failure, brokenness. God takes and says, I'm going to redeem it. The very weakness I'm going to use to build strength. Even we've got our our senior pastor, Pastor G, who shares these amazing messages week in, week out in our church. He's an incredible teacher. And yet he, uh, he would hardly share in class. He went to speech therapy because he wasn't talking enough as he was growing up as a child. He went through Bible college and managed to almost last three years without speaking once. I think he did just speak once in those three years. And they were meant to speak regularly. But it's because he didn't want to speak. He didn't want the spotlight. Who's the person that is raised up who speaks to thousands internationally every week? It's G. It's the guy who, the young boy who didn't want to speak who didn't want to be in the spotlight. And if you were looking at this kid, if you look at this little boy, you go, not that guy. No, it's, 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 no that's, not, that's not in him. But that's who God wants to use. And so I just want to bring this like home to us about how this works out in the real world because there is something about our understanding of weakness that we've rejected but we actually need to embrace. And I believe that that's what God wants to do tonight in all across our barbarians. Here in Raleigh and all where you are, that God is wanting you to see your weakness in a new way and come and reclaim it and redeem it and use it for his glory. Some weakness can open a door for sin in our lives and cause us shame. While others, it might not be a sin issue, but they impact our confidence. And I want to give an opportunity as we finish, and we're going to do this now, separate in locations. But first of all, for those that their weakness has become sin. So there's something about that weakness came into our life, where it is our, our failing in terms of uh, consistency, of discipline, of character. And that weakness actually it opened a door. And we need to talk about that and confess it and air it tonight. Or second of all, where those weaknesses is shaken their confidence. So you're someone where maybe it has been insecurity. Maybe it's a label that you've picked up. Maybe it's a way that you've perceived yourself. But it's shaken your confidence to stop you from doing all that God's called you to do. But if we can rewire as men that we're not strong until we acknowledge our weaknesses then we're going to see God use us in mighty ways, guys, across the world. And I want to just tell you, there is hope for each one of us today. If you felt weak, if you're willing to trust God with your weakness, just wait and see what he does as you do that. So guys, God bless you as you've received this response now. I just pray, open your heart and allow God to minister to you as you just come to him and bring your weakness before him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.